Welcome to another episode of The Warning Woods. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider giving it five stars and writing a review. Reviews help spread the podcast to more listeners. If you want more creepy content, follow me on Instagram and TikTok at The Warning Woods. I'm Miles Thomas Tritle, and this story is called The Child Inside. Sarah Reynolds stumbled into a Ouija board session when she was 15 years old. Some kids had found the board in a closet during a house party. They invited her to join in before they knew she wasn't interested in who loves who and will they won't they questions. She had a much deeper spiritual curiosity, one she had been feeding since she was a little girl. Is the spirit of a dead person here? Sarah asked, ignoring the strange glances from her peers. The planchette slid to no, much to the amusement of the other kids. Sarah became nervously excited. Are you an evil spirit? she asked. The planchette practically teleported across the board, nearly escaping the kid's fingertips on its way to yes. A cocky boy who hadn't been touching the planchette whooped obnoxiously. The others grew visibly hesitant. Two of them removed their hands from the board, and one left the room altogether. Anyone else want to ask a question? Sarah asked the room of stunned classmates. As everyone shook their heads, she went on. Can you tell us your name? The planchette moved to no. Can you tell us what you want? Back to yes. Murmurs surrounded Sarah as she asked the board these questions. By this point, everyone else had removed their hands from the planchette, leaving Sarah alone touching the board. So, Sarah asked, seeming to hesitate for the first time, what do you want? The planchette rested for about five seconds before spelling out C-H-I-L-D. Child. You want a child? Yes. Is the child here? Yes. Sarah asked if anyone had a little sibling around, but to the collective knowledge of the group, no children were in the house. Where is the child? Sarah asked the spirit. I-N-S-I-D-E. Inside, Sarah repeated for the others. It thinks there's a kid inside the house. Well, there's not, the cocky whooping boy said. Guess it's just a stupid toy after all. The planchette tore away from Sarah's hand, flew across the room, and struck the boy in the face, cutting open his eyebrow. Blood trickled down his wrist as he held his hand over the wound. You're insane, he shouted at Sarah. The others stood up, giving Sarah disapproving looks as they filed out of the room. I didn't do that, Sarah pleaded with them, but no one believed her. A few days later, Sarah woke up feeling sick to her stomach. She stayed home from school, convincing her parents she had caught the flu. She probably caught it from her boyfriend, Nate, she told them. But Sarah had caught something much more serious than a passing flu bug from Nate. After a couple of violent bouts of illness in the morning, her symptoms vanished. She waited for a fever, for the aches and chills that usually accompany a virus, but they never came. Once her parents went to work, Sarah biked to the closest convenience store and bought a test. The test came in a two-pack. When the first showed a positive result, Sarah tried the second. Unless they were both defective, she was undoubtedly pregnant. Pregnant, she thought, at 15 years old. What a way to start your life. She told Nate right away. He tried talking her into an abortion. I only have like 200 bucks right now, so I can't really pay for it, but I can pay for like half if you want. That made Sarah laugh for the first time since she'd learned of her pregnancy. Not wanting an abortion, but knowing the child's father would be useless, Sarah had no choice but to come clean with her parents. They were angry, frighteningly so. They offered no support, no solutions. Later, Sarah couldn't recall if they had kicked her out or if she had left their abuse on her own accord. However it happened, Sarah ended up living on the street or on friends' couches when she could. Eight months later, a fireman would arrive for his shift and discover a screaming baby boy in front of the door. Eight years later, that baby boy, now named Joe, 
would be bouncing around the foster care system like a pinball. No matter how long each placement lasted, no matter how many points he earned with a family, Joe would miss at some critical moment. One little slip up and that tiny silver ball of hope would roll down where he couldn't save it. Game over. On the evening of his ninth birthday, Joe watched TV with his most recent guardians. They were a kindly older couple, rich with Southern Baptist tradition. In their house, the TV was for watching news and nothing more. The evening news programs proved more exciting than Joe had expected. The phrase, viewer discretion advised, quickly became his favorite sentence. The broadcast on his birthday turned out to be a live stream. The camera focused on a young woman straddling a tall bridge's guardrail. First responders surrounded her at a distance, but her attention was centered solely on the gushing river below. Oh, Harold, I don't think we need to see this, Joe's foster mom Petunia said. Her eyes never left the screen, though. Them TV folks won't show nothing ugly, Harold argued. Please don't turn it off, Joe calmly requested. I want to watch. Now why would you want to see something so terrible, child? Asked Petunia. That's my mommy, Joe replied in a haunting monotone. Harold turned to the boy with a mix of shock and disdain. You never met your mama, boy. What you talking about, that's your mama. It's her, Joe repeated. Her name is Sarah. Sarah Reynolds. The old couple shared helpless glances. Harold shrugged and shook his head, silently reminding Petunia that Joe had had a short but troubled life. He was prone to say wild things, probably just trying to comfort himself. But Joe knew it was his mother straddling that rail. He couldn't tell Harold and Petunia just how he knew, though. No, when he told grown-ups how he knew things they didn't know, they sent him away, and he had to start all over. Petunia tried to shut the TV off when the woman let go of the rail. The remote slipped from her overreactive fingers and tumbled to the floor as the woman tumbled into the rushing water. Before Petunia could find the remote, Harold had crossed the room and turned the TV off. I'm sure they'll get her out. Time for bed, he said. I'm sure they won't, Joe mumbled to himself as he casually walked to his bedroom where he promptly fell asleep. At the breakfast table the following morning, Harold and Petunia's eyes never left Joe. He didn't allow their dissecting gazes to disturb him. He knew why they stared. He'd experienced it numerous times before. The disbelief. The concern. The fear. Boy, Harold choked. He cleared his throat and continued. I'm afraid we have some sad news, but... But I guess you already know. Tears welled up in Petunia's eyes. That woman last night, the woman on the television, she... Her name was Sarah Reynolds. Divers pulled her body out of the tributary this morning. Now Petunia sobbed loudly. She cried, How did you know? How could it be? Promise you won't send me away if I tell you? Joe asked. Now why would we do such a thing as that? Harold retorted. Joe would answer the question in his own way. Sarah Reynolds let the devil inside, said Joe. We live in here, together. He pointed to his head. The old couple drew back, disturbed. Now boy, we won't be having none of that devil talk in this house, you hear? Harold reprimanded. You here? Joe echoed. Harold doubled over, hitting his forehead against the table. He pressed his hands against his ears. Petunia jumped out of her seat and rushed to her husband's side. What's happening, child? She moaned. Joe's mouth quivered as if he were about to cry, but his eyes were black holes void of emotion. They remained focused on the suffering man. Harold's shoulders relaxed a little and he removed his hands from his ears. His palms were slick with blood which could be seen trickling out of each ear and running down his neck. Oh, Harold, Petunia cried, but Harold couldn't hear her. He turned his head from side to side as his eyes darted around the room in panicked confusion. Harold? Harold pointed to his ears and shook his head. You little bastard, what have you done? Petunia shrieked at Joe. It wasn't me, it was him, Joe shouted. Later in the emergency room lobby, 
Petunia tried to call Joe's social worker three times. Each time, her connection got mysteriously interrupted. Each time, she set the phone down and saw Joe boring into her with those abysmal, lifeless eyes. So, unable to use the phone, Petunia drove Joe to the state home while Harold was in surgery. There, she left Joe in front of the building and sped away. Joe got taken in at the home, where they were used to seeing him. The staff learned not to ask questions where Joe was concerned. Best to house him as long as they had to, but try to place him as quickly as possible. The walls banging, the sounds of scraping glass and tapping on windows, and water turning black as tar made the staff work as hard as humanly possible to get Joe out of the home. On the night of his return, Joe had a dream he'd been having since he could remember. The recurring dream depicted his mother, younger than she had been on the TV. She sat on her knees in a circle of teenagers, a Ouija board placed in the center like a bullseye. So, Sarah asked as she always did, what do you want? Joe took hold of the planchette beneath the teenager's fingers and spelled C-H-I-L-D, child. Do you want a child? Sarah, his mother, asked. Joe slid the planchette to, yes. Is the child here? asked his mother. Yes, Joe answered on the board. Sarah asked if anyone had a little sibling around, but to the collective knowledge of the group, no children were in the house. Where is the child? Sarah asked the board. I-N-S-I-D-E, spelled Joe. Inside, Sarah repeated for the others. It thinks there's a kid inside the house. Well, there's not, a stupid boy across from Sarah said. Guess it's just a stupid toy after all. Joe tore the planchet away from Sarah's hand, threw it across the room, and struck the boy in the face. In the commotion that followed, the teenagers forgot to close their session with the board. It remained open for him. It allowed him to enter Sarah and take hold of the child, the child growing inside. He would share the child's body as long as necessary. He was patient. He knew the day would come soon enough for him to take hold of the body all for himself. And on that day, he would become unstoppable.